teachers are alive. They're not books. They are the very living essences of nature itself. Unbelievably powerful supercomputer that's running our reality, and we don't have a clue yep. as to how to operate it. Say in your mind, say to yourself, I am more than my physical body. Because I am more than physical matter, I can perceive that which is greater than the physical world. Seeker. Broadcasting from an undisclosed location somewhere in the deep and mossy creek bottoms of King Creek, Arkansas. Live from Forest Tower Studios, brought to you by the Fringe FM and KTOK Digital Broadcasting. This is Lighting the Board. And now, your host, Joe Rito. All the way from the Forest Tower Studios in the Mossy Creek Bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas, and some crazy undisclosed location here in the South. I'm Joe Roop, and this is Lighting the Void, your voices for verity in this crazy realm of polarity. How are you doing? It's Tuesday. It's good to see you again. It's good to be here again. It is Tuesday the 15th, and the night is feeling really good, and the weather is actually perfect. As the state of the moon is dark and new on into midnight. So fire up your chakras, sink both hemispheres of your brain together, and shoot your magical beam of light through your third eye tonight with us as we peer into the void between spirituality and science. We are live on lightingthevoid.com, KTOK Digital Broadcasting, thefringe.fm, and all those other places out there. Talk stream live, tune in, spreaker. Uh, Radio God FM, Radio Garden, and more by proxy via the Fringe FM. The call to listen line is 701-719-3971. Just use that number. Keep it tight just in case you, you know, if you lose your internet connection. Because that happens. Happens to us, too, sometimes during the live show. That's why we record this stuff. Because you never know. Tonight, we're going to be speaking with author, researcher, and speaker, Freddie Silva. I can't wait to talk about this stuff because I heard Freddie on Ryan Gable's show a while back, and it was one of the greatest shows I ever heard. Um, And he's been on a few other shows, and it's it's really cool to be able to talk to him tonight. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Tomorrow night, the Cruising with Steak podcast will be here. James Cruz and Grim Steak. I'm doing this new thing where I'm going to hang out with all these cool podcast people. So they're going to be here tomorrow night. And then because I interviewed Grow America from the Grow America podcast and listening to their show, I've also got Greg Doyle coming on Saturday for Space Out Saturday. And we're going to be talking about astral travel and all that beautiful stuff. So you guys know that's my favorite subject. And uh, I think that this week is just going to be another cool week for us here because we're doing Freddie Silva. Then we're going to hang out with the boys from Cruising with Steak tomorrow night. And I'm wondering, I don't know, if Farouk Ali might drop in. I'm hoping that he does. But if he doesn't, that's okay Um, because he's a busy man as well. And uh, also you guys can hang out with us in Spreaker. There's a chat room in Spreaker, but I've got a new place for you to hang out too if you haven't heard I'm going to talk about that just in a second. It's uh, really cool. Um, So, yeah, tomorrow night, Cruising with Steak. Saturday, Greg Doyle, the Astral Traveler and Astral Travel Coach. And tonight, we got Freddie Silva. So, yeah, what I was, so when I heard about Freddie Silva, you know, I listened to the Secret Teachings with Ryan Gable during the day. And I think this was a few months back. And they were talking about the Templars. And, you know, there's so many names in this field, and you guys know I'm just, I'm trying to talk to as many people as I can, but there's certain people that I really, really, really want to talk to, and uh, Freddie Silva was one of those, and I, as soon as I heard him, I asked Ryan, I said, I've got to talk to him. Uh, this guy's done his homework. He knows his stuff. Uh, he's also going to be at Contact in the Desert, and the website is invisibletemple.com. He's got a few books out. Uh, we're going to talk about that as well, too. You should really check this guy's work out. It's really good stuff. Um, so, speaking of what I was talking about earlier, the newsletter, when you sign up, when you put your name and email in there, you become a void walker. I kind of ripped that off from uh, 
Where did I rip that off from? Destiny. I don't know if you guys have ever played that video game, but they have these characters in there called Void Walkers, and I thought it was cool, so I used that one. And you, once you be, get that invitation, then there's a you get invited to the chat room. Now these chat rooms are like, I mean, Spreaker chat is cool, but they, it's kind of limited, and you can't really do much. So this chat room is is more intimate, and a bunch of people have already jumped in over there. Hey guys, if you're in there listening. Um, you can do everything you can do in a chat room, but then you can also like post links, pictures, even if you posted a YouTube video, the video's right there. It's right there in the chat room. And then they got bots and moderators. It's kind of like IRC on crack. I think (laughs) that's what it's like, but it's fun. And, um, they've got a voice room that I made for the voice, the void walkers. So if you sign up to the newsletter, uh, what I've done is I've put out an episode. I think I'm going to do another one either la- later tonight or early tomorrow morning. And I do these uncut, uh, uncut music, uncut everything episodes. And they're very short. And I tell you guys about something that's been on my mind lately. And then we all kind of hang out in there. We hang out in the voice room and then we're going to start doing little separate shows in there for the subscribers. So you guys can get involved too and record those. And, um, inside the chat room, inside the void walkers room, there's, there are separate rooms. So there's a room it's discord. If you guys hadn't figured that out yet, but there are separate rooms on the left. So we got a section for books, orbs, UFOs, your dream experiences. And I've found that I've really figured this out from Grimerica America because when I, after I interviewed them, I went and. And I hung out in their chat room and really got to know those guys and a lot of their listeners better. And it is so fun. And so I was like, you know, I don't want to be the copycat type guy, but I want to make my own chat room. And, uh, you know, Graham from Grime America, he was like, go for it, dude. So I did. And it's just been, it's really fun. I haven't gotten much sleep from it, actually, getting to know you. I've talked to some people that actually listen to the show that I've never heard your voice before. And now I've gotten to talk to you in there. And, um, the thing just runs 24 seven. So you can say hi in there whenever you want. And I know some of you are kind of hesitant about it because you feel like you, you know, you have to be seen, but you don't, you can use like a, you don't have to show your picture. You can use a, a, a lower name or a different name. And then you can I say a lower name, but like, you know, a motto or whatever, if you want, and you can still private message in there too. So it's, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to jump away from Twitter or Facebook or on Stellar, but I just think that this is probably the funnest thing I can I can do. And it's I can tell you I haven't got much sleep if and some of you guys know this in the past because I've been on there just playing around. You know, it's fun, and uh, we've we've been sharing our experiences there. So yeah, go to the the lightingthevoid.com. Put your name and email in there. You become a void walker. You'll you can join the chat at lightingthevoid.com forward slash chat. No problem. You can become, you can join the chat. You don't have to sign up to the newsletter to do that. But if you do become a void walker, you'll get void walker status and you'll be able to come into the voice room and be a part of the episodes that we're going to do. And, uh, another thing too, that I saw another network doing L and M is they got bots that actually play the station in the voice room. <laughs> yeah. So I found a new toy is what I'm saying. And I've been in there playing around a lot and I want you guys to come hang out with me. Some of you already have. And another cool thing about it is, is I'm, you know, how I was talking about earlier that, you know, we can really find our, our audience and our people this way. Right? Well, uh, I did. It actually weeded out some of the people that were just trying to get something for signing up. So for instance, like yesterday, I think, 11 people signed up and two people unsubscribed. Well, those two people, they never put their name in. They were kind of like hiding, I think. But the other people, you know, they wanted to hang out. And I've met a couple of people I didn't even know listen to the show. And, you know, you don't they don't really get in the chat, but they private message me in there. And um, I don't know. It's just really cool. Found a new toy. Um, yeah. So uh, the call-in number for tonight, if we open the phones up, which I don't know if we will or not, depending on how deep this conversation goes, is 501-777-5631. 
If you want to ask Freddie any questions, I might open that a lineup. I will tell you, or you might hear Kurt Green announce the phone lines are open. And then you just call in, and you be nice, and you don't cuss because I, I don't screen the call. So, but I don't really have to worry about that. Most for the most part, everybody's really been cool. It's called in. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, yeah, we're on. Uh, we've got two times during the month when things are really hard on us: the first of the month and the nineteenth. And we've got a few days left. We got to get a couple hundred dollars in here in donations to get. Uh, some server costs and internet costs paid, or we're going to be in a pickle. So I'm not begging you, but I am begging you. If you can donate, please do. For those of you that already have, thank you. For those of you that have signed up for your, like some people have signed up to help out monthly, um, whether it's some people have done five, some people have done 30, some people have done 10, uh, but we do take one-time donations as well as, uh, as well. And, um, you know, running two shows in the network, you know, that's all I do. And uh, I don't live an extravagant life because of it. I mean, this morning I put my last tire on my car. I buy with my tires used, by the way. But I put one on the car, got a flat, so now I'm out of tire. And then my headphones are taped on my head right now. So it's rugged, it's fun, but it does cost. And so if you can help out, man, that would be great. I'd really appreciate it if you can. If you can't, then spread the word, and I would appreciate that too. So if you find anything of value from this network or the show, please donate. The donate buttons are there on the website on both the Fringe FM and Lighting the Void, right? Um, Some of the supporters we have, I always want to give a shout-out to Eric Markham, Matthew Hendrickson, Jacob Sims, Joseph Carrera, David Winkle, David Johnson. I'm probably going to miss a couple of you. Um, Dennis Yeg, all of you guys, thank you so much for your help. Also, some new supporters on social media. Uh, and when you, you know, just follow the show on Facebook, or if you follow the show on uh, on Stellar, I give you a shout out. I don't really do Twitter or YouTube because most people don't use their real names there. But Alex Tutal, Tenny Kumar, Danielle Flores, Chad Warren, Lily Kick Kiskinen, sorry, uh, John. I already said that one before. Allison Bell, Nett Moody, Simon Hannibus, Billy Carson, John Greenwald, Jake May, Charles Merritt, Abigail, Dell, Deborah Burns, and Destry Brady. I might have repeated a couple names twice, but that's okay. I got them all mixed up. So, yeah, the I'm just excited about the Void Walkers room. Um, I'm really impressed about how, I got to say, about how Grime America... I mean, they just inspired me. So I thought, you know, I've, I listen to their podcast forever, and I'm always trying to learn how to do shows better and how to to relate to my audience better. And I thought it was all about the content. Well, not necessarily. It's all about how you connect with your audience. And watching those guys, how they hang out with their audience and how they connect with them and what they do, they do all kinds of things for their audience. And it was really really inspiring so i'm gonna start doing that more especially for you subscribers and donators by the way if you donate to you you automatically become a void walker it doesn't matter how much just uh when you jump in the chat room tell me who you are if i don't recognize you and i'll give you that status your little name will turn purple in there so uh yeah so follow like subscribe everything lighting the void the hashtag is ltv radio on twitter um I don't have any private emails today. I don't really have any rants. I do have something in the news I'm going to rant about that uh, kind of upset me that I feel like as a broadcaster, I have to say, but I want to thank the team real quick. Everett Themer, my business consultant, business slash business guy, and Tessa and Nicole for helping me out with the booking and, and really helping out. Do you guys catch our show Sunday? That was a really cool show. She, I think she did great for her first time, so... She's now host of Spaced Out Sundays, and um, I think she did a great job. On with this thing here that I, I saw before I wanted to launch this show, it made me sick. And I posted it in the Void Walkers room, and it's, I don't, it's very hard to talk about, but I feel like this is one of those things that if we ignore it, so we all want to live in a... Um, in an enlightened society, right? 
we all want to hey ramon thank you for your support too see i remembered i forgot to say your name um but we all want to live around people that have hearts and in an enlightened society but what we really want to do is when we leave our children with somebody we want to know that everything is going to be okay right if you got children you know exactly what i'm talking about this is hard to talk about. I almost don't want to even mention it, but I'm really angry about it. <sighs> All right. So in, in Florida, and I don't know how to say the name of the city, but it's OCLA, an investigation is underway after it was reported that a teacher at Forest High School drowned wild raccoons in a large garbage bin while students in her agri or in his excuse me agriculture class assisted and watched the mother of one of the students who was in the class monday who asked to remain anonymous which i guess i can understand that but said that her son came home in tears over what happened to the animals which the teacher said they, that the raccoons have been killing the class chickens. So this is a, a, a teacher teaching about farming and agriculture, right? And the mother said, it made me sick. It made me sick to my stomach. It's terrible. It still makes me sick to my stomach. And one of the kids actually took a video. The pictures in the video recorded that the students, it showed a raccoon in a metal wire trap which the teacher and students then lifted into a garbage bin. So he had the students help him drown this raccoon while they filled it with water from several hoses. And when the raccoon tried to come up for air, they had metal rods and they had, and they held him down. They held the raccoon down with metal rods. And when the raccoon would try to pop its head up for, for air, they would put the water hose in its face to drown it. Now, I'm not playing. There's a video of it on there. I put it in the Void Walker's room for people that don't believe me that want to see how sick this person is. So that's who you're leaving your kid with. Now, I went to, uh, you know, I grew up in the South. We had to, we've had to kill animals for all kinds of reasons out here, and it sucked every time. doesn't matter what it is. Squirrel, deer, cow. Even we've had to put down horses. There is a way to do that. And first of all, if you've got an animal out here that's destroying whatever, all you got to do is trap it. Just trap it. And then call animal control or whoever, and they'll come get it. They'll get it out of there. But I would say this, at the very least, if you're going to do something with it, you put it out of its misery quick, but you damn sure don't do it around children. Number one. And you damn sure don't drown it in front of the kids. I am so freaking mad about this right now. I mean, if I saw this dude, I'd probably, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. And to think that my son is watching this guy that has absolutely, see, this is the kind of people that we're leaving our kids with. So we got all these people in our society as children and cops and teachers and whoever that we trust. We say goodbye to our kids. We give them their little lunch bag and we, we're doing what we tell ourselves not to worry because worrying is just going to be, you know, don't worry. Worrying is just going to drive you crazy. And then that's who we leave our kids with. Somebody needs a fire this person at the very least and i'm sorry that any of the kids had to see that and i'm sure some of the kids are going to grow up and be just like him because now they got it in their heads that it's okay to do that to drown little animals because they get on your nerves if you're like that i don't want to be anywhere around you don't come around me but in another cool news real sto story real quick this captain lou Pretty cool deal, right? He's being loaded a hero for landing the plane despite the cabin windscreen that blew blew uh, it blew out. Uh, he had just reached an altitude of thirty two thousand feet 
When a deafening sound tore through the cab- cabin, the cockpit experienced a sudden loss of pressure and drop in temperature. And when he looked over, the right windshield was gone. And he said, man, it was terrifying when he realized that his colleague had been sucked out of the window. There was no warning sign. Suddenly, the windshield just cracked and made a loud bang. And the next thing he knows, his co-pilot is sucked halfway out the window at 32,000 feet. He said everything in the cockpit was floating in the air. Most of the equipment was malfunctioning, and he couldn't even hear the radio. But he landed the plane. All was well. So good for that guy. Usually I do some space news or something about, you know, uh, aliens or something of that nature. But I thought that was a cool story. And I had to call this teacher out. I thought it was a lady, but it's actually a dude, which doesn't make it any better. But somebody needs to do something about teachers like that, for real. And uh, anyways, so we're going to learn about some cool stuff. We got Freddie Silva coming up. You guys don't go anywhere. When we come right back, Freddie Silva is going to be joining the show. It's going to be an interesting conversation. Stick around. Then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. This is Reverend John M. Polk from johnpolkmedia.com, and you can listen to my show, The Quantum Hologram Matrix, every Thursday night. ETs, UFOs, metaphysics, the paranormal, and more are some of the many topics we will cover on The Quantum Hologram Matrix. Make sure you bring your higher concentric, multidimensional selves. That's every Thursday night, 5 p.m. Pacific, right here on The Fringe FM. If you have hard water, the lime scale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate lime scale and other water issues like brown staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Oh, you know what I like about me? <laughs> this is Rich Giordano, host of The Paranormal Code. No, I'm serious. The show's on twice a week now, Sunday and Thursday, on the Fringe.fm and Spreaker, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific. Yeah, it's two hours. It's live. And I do a show like you've never heard before. So you're going to come here, you're going to get your information, you're going to be entertained. But you're also going to hear the truth like, you know, you won't forget like you've never heard before and for those of you who've been following thank you thank you for talking me into this extra night now i'm on twice great hey good for you right the paranormal code this means something do you find yourself bored and longing to learn more about the mysteries and conspiracies behind our reality Specifically, every Friday night from 7 to 9 Pacific? What a coincidence, because that's exactly when me, Gigi, and my lovely co-host Cortana kicked over the airways with just the right amount of intellectual stimulation to give you that eargasm of conversational excellence that you deserve. So be sure to check out our show, Shift Habits, every Friday night from 7 to 9 Pacific, that's 9 to 11 Central, and let's shake some talk radio tail feather, shall we? 
right here on KTLK, The Fringe FM. KTLK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe.fm, Napa Valley, California, Little Rock, Arkansas. You've probably heard about all the great benefits of goat milk soap. But did you know, some companies take shortcuts. At Old New England Soap, we make our organic goat's milk soap using 36% goat's milk. That's 17% more than most others. Our bars are larger, so they last longer, producing lots of lather packed with vitamins. And our soap is a natural moisturizer that smooths dry and damaged skin. Order online at oldnesoap.com. That's oldnesoap.com. You've tried the rest. Now try the best. Oldnesoap.com. Water-based soaps on supermarket shelves use harsh chemical acids to break down dead skin cells. And that's just not good for you. At Old New England Soap, our soaps are made without chemical ingredients, contain no alcohol or petroleum products, and use 85% organic materials and carry the USDA's organic certification. Try some today. Go to oldnesoap.com. That's oldnesoap.com. Oldnesoap.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. I'm your host, Joe Roop. Don't forget, tomorrow night, the fellas from Cruising with Steak are going to be on here. And then Saturday, I'll be over at Spaced Out Radio speaking with Astral Traveler and Coach Greg Doyle. We're going to bring on our guest, Freddie Silva. Now, Freddie Silva is one of the world's leading researchers of sacred sites, ancient systems of knowledge, and the interaction between temples and consciousness. He is also the world's leading expert uh, on crop circles phenomenon, on the crop circles phenomenon. He has lectured internationally for over 15 years and appeared on Discovery Channel, the History Channel, BBC, numerous video documentaries, the national and international radio sh- or national and international radio shows described by the CEO of the Universal Light Expo as perhaps the best metaphysical speaker in the world right now for two decades. He has been on the inter- He has been an international keynote speaker with notable appearances at the International Science and Consciousness Conference, the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energies and Energy Medicine, and the Association for Research and Enlightenment. In addition to the History Channel, BBC, Gaia TV, and radio shows such as Coast to Coast. He is also a documentary filmmaker, art photographer, and leads private tours to sacred sites in England, France, Egypt, Portugal, Yucatan, Malta, Peru, Bolivia, Scotland, and Ireland. You can check out his website at invisibletemple.com. And Freddie Silva, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. Well, thanks for having me, Joe. Absolutely. I'm glad to have you. I heard you on Ryan Gable's show talking about uh, the Knights Templar. And I am such a big researcher of ancient mysteries, the mystery schools, esoteric knowledge, and I used to watch these shows, how they would talk about the Knights Templar being these evil devil worshiping people. And I was like, wait a minute. I thought that these people were, <laughs> you know, they're the, the keepers of the mysteries. You know, they were protective of these secrets. They were, I admired them. And I was like, this isn't right. And, you know, and it wasn't too long after that, that I heard you speaking about, Hey, this is what these guys were actually doing. And they were the, you know, the protectors of this stuff. And this is what they were teaching. It was all about the ancient mysteries. And uh, if you guys, I recommend you guys go back and listen to that show too on uh, the secret teachings or any show that you've done. And so I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a, a sort of a strange subject, the Templars. I mean, uh, especially if you listen to uh, or watch a certain TV show, which I won't mention on air. Um, uh, it's amazing how much stuff there is out there that bears no resemblance to any reality, and it really comes from the misunderstanding of anything that you're not part of. You know, it's uh, you know just because something's secret doesn't mean it's nefarious. Uh, and when it comes to the Templars, um, yeah, I mean they started off with a, in a very high esoteric 
group, uh, they were protecting some very interesting secrets because if you put it into the context of the time of the Middle Ages, I mean, the church was very dominant in Europe, and it was hated and feared by just about everybody. So in that context, you had this small group of people who were showing a very, very different uh, way to personal enlightenment. So it must have seemed like nirvana to people at the time, which is why people were giving over all their money to them, which was then held in escrow to be basically awarded to places where it was really needed. So, you know, they, they built schools, they uh, created a system of welfare for people who needed a uh, sort of a leg up in life. Uh, they looked after the sick and the infirm. They taught people uh, how to take care of crops and the land and protect themselves. So it was like the uh, the perfect welfare system, except they also came with a spiritual benefit. Um, but of course, the church uh, turned that whole thing around, and their informants, uh, who actually penetrated the order later on in their years, uh, and by then it also had grown to such a point where it became unmanageable. I mean, there were a lot of people that were joining the Templars to do some really stupid things. Uh, and just like any major organization that grows well above and beyond its boundaries. So there is that towards the end of the uh, uh, its 200-year history. Um, but uh, the informants were basically telling the church that uh, they were worshipping some kind of a devil called Baphomet and that they completely misunderstood what was going on because uh, if you're an Arab at the time and uh, you've mentioned that to them, they'll say, ah, before uh, Hilame. Uh, that means the head or the source of wisdom. And of course, it related to the one thing that the Templars really cared about. And that was the mummified head of John the Baptist, who, of course, was their spiritual leader or late spiritual leader. Uh, and uh, that's all they cared about, because um, John the Baptist stood for a, a very long history of uh, people who were uh, indoctrinated into the secret teachings. So for them, he was the end all and be all of everything. So the whole thing gets completely turned uh, upside down, that they were worshipping some kind of a devil, and it really was so far from the truth. Yeah, not to mention that some, you know, the... the <clears throat> churches of Satan or whatever they they use that symbol and it, it it triggers people as well but if you really do the the research on it I think it's I mean I, I'm, I'm gonna put it to you this way a lot of people say oh you know that guy's a Freemason or this guy's this and that and it's got to be some type of secret evil plot going on but every book I've ever read by any of the ancient uh, Masons or anything about Egypt or uh, the Templars, it's all the teachings have been just enlightening and beautiful things. So I've never exactly. seen what's wrong with any of this stuff. That's just me. Yeah, again, it's uh, no, it's uh, it's part of a, a campaign of deception by people who'd rather have control over you. Uh, and they basically turn everything that's good into something that's completely evil or give it the, the perception of. Um, all, all that any power that, uh, that B has to do is put doubt into any situation. It could be about any subject. It could be about politics. Uh, it could be about health care. It could be anything. All you have to do is put in the doubt. And as soon as people start doubting, they fight amongst each other. And this is how the uh, rich win. Um, and in this case, it really follows uh, that uh, the Freemasons, um, there are two branches of Freemasonry, and the first branch, the oldest, is actually the Knights Templar who basically changed their uh, name. Uh, there was a big PR campaign at the time around 1312 uh, after they'd been expelled from France and uh, they basically went underground. Uh, they left for Portugal where they already um, had lived. In fact, they created the, the Portuguese nation state as the first uh, independent nation state of Europe. Uh, which is what my uh, fourth book was all about, really. Uh, and then uh, they also went to Scotland, where they had a lot of friends. And uh, when they got to Scotland, they basically changed their name to the Scottish Rite Freemasons uh, after a ceremony on a sacred hill, uh, which was performed on the equinox sunrise, uh, when the main Templar knight got on top of the hill and uh, greeted Venus before the sunrise, which is a, uh, a system of initiation oh, that goes back at least 8,000 years. Uh, that's a mark of the risen initiate. Uh, which eventually becomes the symbol of Christianity, even though they also completely misunderstood the original uh, Christian story. But that's another uh, for another evening. Um, so basically, the uh, Scottish Rite uh, were actually upholding and still are upholding what the, the uh, Templars were originally teaching. Where it gets a little bit uh, confusing is where suddenly you come up with the London Rite of Freemasonry, which appears in, se in the 18th century, uh, about 1717, I believe. And uh, essentially, from what I'm told from the uh, people on the inside, 
Um, these people have a really very little idea of what it is that they're doing. Uh, some do. depends on your uh, particular um, place where you perform your rituals. Uh, but they were saying that you know most of these people that perform the London Rite have no idea what they're doing or what it is that they're actually mumbling about. It's become a kind of a, a boys' club for secret handshakes and for doing nefarious things in politics and finance. And so there is some truth to that. I mean, the Skull and Bone Society at Yale is a classic example of uh, alumni who've done some very, very sick things uh, throughout their tenure in government and politics. Uh, and then, of course, you have a minority in that who've also done some you know, pretty nice things, but I have to say they are a minority. So again, you've got to choose which particular faculty you're working with and also which version of Freemasonry you're working with. But fundamentally, you're right. The teachings are extremely ancient, and they all hark back to a time you know, close to the time of Enoch, uh, the biblical prophet, uh, who was also a person who was very much into the uh, mysterious teachings. Wow. Yeah, see, that I'm glad that you said all that because that validates pretty much everything that I've kind of looked at and read. You know, it's uh, and I've got a a fella that's messaging me. Telling me he, as soon as he he asked me, he said, "Ask him about Scotland." As soon as he's as soon as uh, he asked that, you started talking about it. So <laughs> I just came from there, actually. <laughs> yes, I I think it's a great thing, and and a lot of the guys that I've met from the, especially you know the Scottish right uh, Masons were just incredible people. They're all about you know trying to to fix yourself first and then do something good for the planet, you know. But uh, um, exactly. And they also allow women into their um, uh, into their secrets as well, which is what the tr the tr real uh, Templars and the real teachings were supposed to be doing. It wasn't a masculine thing. I mean, that, anything that uh, excludes half the population cannot end well. <laughs> right. And and can I ask you? Just, I'm just going to shoot this right out of the gate here because some of these things uh, have just boggled me throughout time. You know, I grew up a Christian. My dad used to make me, uh, read Bible stories is way before I got into UFOs. I knew something was up with this. And some of the, uh, the talks about just some of the sayings like that saying bridegroom. And I always thought there was something to that. You know, the, the marriage supper, the wedding, the bridegroom, I always thought this has got to be a deeper, more metaphorical, spiritual thing, and it's not just about whether you're going to heaven or hell, you know? Oh, absolutely. The whole thing was completely taken out of context. Um, when I began to write The uh, Lost Heart of Resurrection, uh, it really came from years of ob observing temples and how they behave, and some secret rooms that were decreed to be bridal chambers or burial chambers, but no one was ever actually physically buried in them, uh, including the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid and stuff like that. And um, I began to research early Christianity. I mean, uh, like you, I was raised a, a Catholic. I didn't have a choice. Uh, and then I kind of sort of uh, weed myself out of it because something just didn't feel right. And uh, I, got, I went back to the original Christian doctrine, which were the Gnostic Christians. And these people were following essentially the Buddhists, and then they were following the Zen masters of uh, China. We're talking about different people following the same principle uh, over thousands of years. And it turns out that uh, when you start reading uh, what Jesus was saying in the Bible and a lot of the passages that make no sense whatsoever in the Bible, uh, through an esoteric point of view, and certainly from the initiation language, it makes absolute sense. In fact, it's amazing that the church was giving so much information away as though they expected to be caught red-handed one day. Um, I mean, the bridegroom is a wonderful uh, moment where, because it talks about how you know, um, the uh, final act of initiation, uh, this is after three years when you've actually learned you know, the really big secrets of initiation and how to leave the body uh, consciously, how to control the electrical nervous impulses of your body and also control the uh, use of emotion and specifically controlling fear. That was always a big, big uh, moment in your initiation. Uh, and you were given all of these incredible trials to really bring out the worst fears in you, and you had to control it. Uh, a fear is a, 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 an extraordinary tool to basically control vast sums of people. Uh, if you can learn to control that within yourself, now you're basically on top of the world. So it turns out that the, throughout the world where you had these uh, ceremonies for the final act of initiation, the um, initiate had to marry a bride, uh, which, of course, I got very excited about this. This, this is all very romantic. But right. it turns out that uh, he or she would always marry this person in a dark chamber or in a cave or in a man-made mountain 
uh, always in the dark, and I'm thinking, is this woman really ugly? I mean, why is this, uh, <laughs> this woman always get married in the dark? Uh, it turns out that, um, and this is, I'd love to know how they figure this out, because it goes back to at least prehistoric times, where our uh, ancient predecessors, they figured out that, um, in, you know, before everything existed, before time, before light, before sound, before the Big Bang, there existed a creator god. And this creator god must have been a pretty intelligent person because it basically knew everything that exists. Otherwise, how could it not create the universe if it didn't know a heck of a lot of stuff? So they basically reasoned that um, this creative force was um, best exemplified by a feminine force because the feminine force is expansive. Uh, it gives birth. So they figured, let's basically take this woman and we'll paint her black because she basically hides in the dark because there's still no light, there's no sound, there's no universe. In the beginning, there was just darkness. So this divine woman resides in the dark. She is a divine virgin. And essentially, they used her as the metaphor for the woman that the initiate marries once he or she crosses into the other world, completely alive, by the way. It was actually a very dangerous induced out-of-body experience. Uh, some people actually left the body for seven days, went walk about in the other world. Mm. They learned all kinds of extraordinary material. And, and then, I'm not talking about shamanism. I'm talking about something way and above and beyond shamanism here. And basically, they, when they achieved the goal of acquiring this specialist knowledge, they were said to marry this divine bride who was a, a black woman. And of course, we know this very well in medieval Europe because she's called the Black Madonna. So there's nothing about her coming from Ethiopia or being from the Sudan or being black-skinned. It's just that it's all about metaphors. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Everything is always about metaphors. So once you understand the metaphor of the, uh, the black virgin and the, uh, the bride and the, uh, uh, who's married with the bridegroom inside the bridal chamber, it was essentially the metaphor for the initiation chamber where they performed the biggest secret of all. And uh, three to five days later, you come back into your body, uh, a little bit groggy, and uh, the person who was actually in charge of this most important uh, part of your initiation uh, was usually a woman, which is why the church basically turned on the women uh, when they took power. Uh, and my Mary Magdalene was given such a bad shrift in history. It was because it was a patriarchal system taking over from a matriarchal system, which had been done, been done for at least 8,000 years, as the records show, and uh, basically this woman took you on the mound and the first thing you saw was Venus rising above sunrise at the spring equinox and you declared risen from the dead. Uh, and, and the phrase is actually very telling because it, it feels a bit of a joke. The initiates would always look at people who go through life. Uh, if they're not really awakened, they have a mundane life, it's painful, uh, it's full of superstition and gossip and they were literally described as the dead. But the moment you discover the knowledge of the universe, the mechanics of nature, and her, uh, learn to apply those in real life, you are now the living. Uh, in fact, in, in the, the Hindu culture today in, in India, they still refer to the unawakened people as uh, the corpses. So there's a bit of a joke here uh, at uh, the expense of the unenlightened, but it's not derogatory. It's just a way that they have, they have a bit of humor. Wow. I wonder if that's what Christ meant when they, when he said, you know, follow me, right? And he said, let me bury my brother, right? And he said, let the dead bury the dead, right? Yeah, I exactly. think that's it's exactly what he's talking about. I am the way. Uh, basically, he gives away his biggest level of initiation because when you're following the way, you're following a tradition that goes back to Japan in 8,000 B.C., and it's called the 17 Ways. Uh, we call this uh, the Tao or uh, the Tao uh, in Western culture now. And essentially, it's 17 rules by which you come to learn to become a, your spiritual self. And it's rather interesting, going back uh, to our conversation about the Scottish Rite Freemasons, that their highest uh, and most important spiritual uh, level is the 17th degree, which is uh, the, it's called the Night of the East and the West. So basically, it's referring to the equinox. When you basically come to understand light and dark in equal balance, you are holding that balance within yourself. You're not too lighty. You're not too dark either. You hold that fine balance, and a person that understands the difference between the two uh, is truly enlightened. See, this is incredible stuff. This, this information, it, it seems to be understood by more people now 
than it did obviously back then. Do you think it's time? I mean, do you think they planned on having, I guess, all of this information come out now during this this age? Oh, I think it goes up and down through history. I mean, the more I look back at this and more I research it, the more I find that there are opportune times when you put your head over the uh, the castle wall, and there are times when you duck down. Uh, I think the initiates got tired of being burnt alive and boiled to death <laughs> and having uh, nails put through them and stuff like that. Uh, they basically realized that there are some times when you just have to lie low. And uh, this is why the use of metaphor and symbol was so important. Um, like, again, in, in medieval Europe, I mean, there were the Rosicrucians, there was the Invisible College, right. uh, there was the Templars, there was all kinds of interesting people going around. And uh, they basically communicated with each other through symbols, uh, through metaphors, through parables, like Jesus used to do. Uh, so that's, you know, on one level, most people would see this as pure entertainment. But on another level, people who are a little bit more aware and curious, they'll read between the lines and go, wait a minute, that means something else. Uh, I, I mean, the classic one, of course, is the stories of the Grail, that the Templars were proposing all around through Europe. And it was all to do with the story of a... You know, a knight who gets mortally wounded, he goes on a quest to overcome 12 obstacles, and at the end, he marries this divine bride. I mean, that's the story of Isis and Osiris. It's a story of Jason and the Argonauts, literally rewritten for a different age, and that's how they got away with it. So, again, today, we, you know, they're coming out of the shadows again, and, uh, and have been for the last at least 30, 40 years. There's been a a huge rise in this sort of so-called new age movement, except it's not really new age. It's quite old age. Um, and the, the people who actually follow this kind of work are actually, there's more of us than there are of them. Uh, I mean, when I travel around the world, I, I go to places that you've never even heard of in Ohio. And believe me, in uh, you know rural conservative Ohio, I have a lot of people coming out and filling in very large rooms, and it gives me a lot of confidence that uh, people, wow. you know, like you and I, are thinking the same way, and that we just don't attract attention. I mean, let's face it: when was the last time you, you know, good news was presented oh, on television or in the newspaper? It's pretty rare to hear good news. Yeah. So, uh, and it's not done nefariously. They just have to sell newspapers, and they realize that. Tension creates headlines and creates interest, and that sells newspapers. It's, I, I mean, I've, I've worked in media for many years, and I finally came to the conclusion that there's not really a nefarious thing behind all these headlines, uh, unless, of course, you're talking about certain you know, right-wing uh, groups that are, are taking over most of the media in this country, and I mean America, by the way. Um, so, um, you know, there's one particular uh, group called Sinclair uh, that owns 72% um, of the news outlets. And it's nothing uh, but propaganda. It has nothing to do with news. And uh, this is a very dangerous time. So the antidote to that, of course, are the teachings. And there's a lot of people who basically are, you know, they're keeping an eye on what the snakes are doing because you've got to keep an eye on what the snakes are up to. Um, otherwise, you basically are ignorant of life around you. But at the same time, you don't have to buy into it. And, uh, you know, you go to the right conferences, you read the right books, uh, and then you basically follow your own little path and, you know, tend your own garden. And that's the way it's always been done. You do what you can, where you can, and then see what effect that does. And some people will get it, and some won't, and that's the way it's always going to be. It's, uh, it's called Earth. Uh, it's, um, this is a big school. It's always going to be a big school. You can't fix it. It's just the way it is. There's no doubt about that. That's for sure. I think that, and like I was mentioning earlier, you know, I, I bring up the Bible a lot. It's because it's really one of the only books that was pounded into me. But, you know, he, he <laughs> talked about, uh, you know, um, if you see the man uh, carrying the pitcher of water, come up into the upper room and I'll meet you there. Right. And I used to ask my father, uh, Freddie, I said, Dad, why would Jesus be talking about some guy walking down the street carrying a pitcher of water? What? Why is that written in a, in a gospel? Why is that important? And he would just be like, oh, you know, the, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Well, if you, you know, <laughs> if you look at the symbol of that, well, that's Aquarius, right? Like, yeah. Or, and then... I don't know if we're in this age or not, but I wonder if he was talking about, because some people say we are, some people say we're not. But I was wondering, 
maybe it goes deeper than that. Is he talking about an age where people start waking up or is he talking about something deeper? And this is what fascinates me. Books like Manly P. Hall and people that, you know, are into occultism. And when I say occultism, that means they look into the meaning of things more than yeah. what it is on the surface. That's all, you know. Yeah, I mean, occult, occult means hidden from the eye or hidden from view. Uh, kind of like heretic, uh, which originally meant someone in possession of the facts who's able to choose. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I'm sure. And, you know, let's go, let's go there. Now, you, do a, you have a book about crop circles. You're into symbolism. I mean, a, a man that is intelligent as you are about the mystery schools, and by the way, everything you said about fear and all that stuff lines up exactly with what I can tell you. I'm going to tell you about that after the next break. But you you have a book about crop circles. You're into symbolism. You're into ancient monuments and stuff. And I had a conversation with John Anthony West about this, that these things triggered our subconscious. And that I've always thought that or looked at the subconscious yeah. as the doorway to being able to speak with this other realm, you know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's, it's always been said that uh, the sign of uh, an advanced civilization lies in its ability to encode uh, a library of information into a simple symbol. Uh, the hieroglyphs are great examples. I mean, you can read, the, read them left to right, right to left, up to down, down to up. Uh, you can interpret them literally or metaphorically or symbolically. Uh, you can also feel them. Uh, they're also energetic forms, and you can work with them in healing. Uh, I've talked about multifaceted, and uh, that was one of the things that uh, really helped us to kind of crack the uh, the crop circle code in its early days. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff nowadays that's actually man-made, unfortunately, but in the early days of the phenomenon, when it was really quite real and very serious, um, there's a lot of information that uh, was used for technology, for example. There are there's one particular symbol which I actually use for the front cover of the book, um, and I knew exactly uh, what it does. That's why I put it there. Uh, and we were told in those uncertain terms that it was to do with the um, manipulation of gravity, that people would be used or have suggestions put into their heads that they would design these anti-gravity devices. And I can say that uh, there are three groups of people, uh, one in England, one in America, and one in Australia, who have used the blueprint for that crop circle, and they have built anti-gravity devices, and they work. They're just waiting for the right political moment to bring this out to the public. Oh, As wow. you know, even people who developed uh, water-based cars have a habit of dying mysteriously all of a sudden. So, again, they've learned. Uh, you know, you wait for the right moment. Uh, you keep it underground. You tell the right people. And slowly, by the time the powers that be find out about it, it'll be too late because we'll probably all have one. Um, but it's, it's, in, it's an incredible phenomenon. And, I mean, it's, uh, I, I kind of describe them as living temples. Uh, because they are built exactly in the same principles as a pyramid or as a Stonehenge. The only difference is that they're made with pressed crop, um, and uh, they have a very high spiritual content. Uh, some of the symbols we actually use in the healing arts, which is extraordinary. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating topic and probably the most important phenomenon that's happening in our time. And uh, I think it's quite timely too, given what we're going through right now. We're you know we're in the middle of huge changes. And, uh, of course, we all get a little bit of help from outside sources, um, if you know what I mean, Absolutely. Uh, at certain times. And it's always happened through history. This is their way of basically saying, you know, we're kind of like guardian angels. Uh, you do have them. Uh, we see that humanity is going to go through some serious trouble up ahead. And here are some symbols that we're going to present to you. Of course, you have to figure it out, but we'll also be using people to write books and do the right thing and put the information out there to get the ball rolling. Uh, and that's exactly what's happened. Uh, in fact, when I remember back in the days when I was, you know, I really did not want to write a book about crop circles. I was doing quite well, earning a living doing something else. I didn't want to become a poor author. And it turns out that the book becomes a bestseller. Uh, and the rest is history. And uh, I've been on, you know, uh, I've been talking about this now for 15 years without stopping. So I guess someone was actually looking after me as well. But it's interesting how during these times, these symbols had begun to turn people around. And they are, I believe, uh, inherent in the changes that we're now going through. And, and uh, we're actually uh, applying the uh, information from those symbols which then leads us to the concept of uh, ancient temples and why we suddenly we're more interested in temples than at any other point in, in living history. I mean, for the last 2,000 years, we've been destroying these things, and suddenly everybody wants to go to an ancient temple. 
And I think that's, that's part of this subconscious awakening that's going on. And it's all triggered by all of these symbols that are being laid down across the face of the earth. Do you think we'll ever get back there, Freddie? Like, we'll ever get back to that place where, that they had in maybe an 8,000 B.C. where we were wanting to learn these things and we could get back to that technology. I think we're headed in kind of the wrong direction with this artificial intelligence stuff. And I think the technology they understood was totally different. It was. It was a technology that was based on the understanding of nature. Uh, in fact, I'm writing a new book on this right now about a missing civilization uh, that uh, basically went under the water in 11,000 B.C. And uh, the more I travel around the world, the further away I get from Europe and go to places that don't get much attention, um, the more I understand from the indigenous people just how wrong we've been about everything. Uh, for example, I didn't realize that in South America, in the Andes, and uh, there's a a few people left of the Aymara and the Bukina up in near Lake Titicaca, and they still talk about Mu, the continent, in classrooms. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing. I mean, if you do to teach that in Europe or in the Western world, you'd lose your license <laughs> because it's supposed to be a myth. To them, it's not a myth. It's a real event, and, that's just, and they trace their culture back to these people who were unusual. They were very tall. They certainly knew about the arts of uh, moving rocks through the air, and you had the same story all around the world. So I think that the, the, they knew the understandings of the mechanics of nature, and they knew how to control them. But by the same token, if you read the Vedas in India, they also talk about the wars of the gods, how some of these people you know, thought that this was a good thing. Uh, and sometimes a, too much of a good thing can get to your head. And there were the wars of the gods. And there were descriptions of what sound like nuclear disasters. So they, too, also lost the plot. And uh, so that culture also had to die. So in a way, of, you know, if you look at the big picture, I would say that probably natural catastrophes and meteorite strikes upon the Earth are part of the big picture of how we also as a consciousness influence the universe around us and we bring calamity upon ourselves to restart the clock. So I think that we are where we need to be today for a good reason. I think we have to learn something. Um, I think you can be um, enlightened at any moment in your life if you choose to. Uh, I don't think we need an age to do that in. Um, I mean, in the middle of some of the worst atrocities in Europe, uh, in the Middle Ages, we had the Templars creating these oases of enlightenment. Um, so I think it's always been there. It's always still here. Um, we just get sort of turned away from it because there's so many different uh, things that catch our eye today, like, uh, you know, uh, texting and uh, sticking yeah. to your cell phone and uh, not getting away from it. And uh, I mean, I watch people that go on my tours, and the first the rule I have is no cell phones, no texting. We are here to get back to a world before our own. And believe me, they have a hard time for the first two days to put those things down. <laughs> but after a week of being out in the middle of the fields and engaging with big stones and sometimes having extraordinary experiences, when they get back to the airport, it's really jarring for them. They realize how jarring the modern world really is. And within a year, they'll write back to me and say, you know, that trip changed my life and I've changed my life too. And I've taken on a new form of looking at things and have adapted to things. And not always easy because you have to change your life in innumerable ways. But at the same time, the fringe benefits end up being very good. So I think enlightenment is what it, what it is to the individual. I think we can be enlightened at any particular moment right. of, uh, that we choose to. We don't need a mass movement for that. And I think the journey is a very personal one. And the Egyptians were talking about that as well a long time ago. They said that you know we go through ages where everything is appropriate. And it may seem difficult, but those difficulties are there for a reason. They are there to remind you of something that you've lost that you once cherished. Uh, so it's not a, back, a matter of going backwards and looking at things with rose-colored glasses because things were also bad back then. Uh, it's just that uh, sometimes the, the good things tend to stick out more than uh, others after a period of time have gone past. Uh, it's kind of looking back at Maybury and uh, you know all the films of the 50s in America but, and wondering, wow, the 50s was such a great time. But you know, most of the people that talk about that, they weren't in the 50s. And they didn't realize that every other week there'd be a, a drill to go into a bunker because they were testing for nuclear weapons. So there was the threat of nuclear war in the 50s, which sounds pretty horrible. But, you know, we tend to look back and think, oh, the 50s must have been fantastic in America with the funds and all of that, the happy days. And the music and was so, good. And the music was great. Uh, but, you know, so were the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, mm -hmm. you know. 
I think we just have to, to choose what we, choose, we, we focus on, and then that's what makes our lives uh, so much better. I absolutely agree with you. Um, I'm going to ask you this one more question, and then we'll take a break here from the Void Walkers chat room. Uh, Solo Rocker says, and it's a good question. It's a simple but very good question that a lot of us wonder. These, these teachings and this ancient knowledge is such a good and beautiful thing. Why did Christianity make, why do they make it such a point to teach that it's wrong? <laughs> well, you have to look at the history. Um, this is the one thing that took me so long to write the, uh, the Lost Art of Resurrection. It was a stumbling block for me um, because I only had heard one version of the story. Uh, it turns out that right at the very beginning, there was a group of Christians called the Gnostics, uh, and they were pretty much following very ancient traditions. They're doing the right thing. Uh, even the women were involved in this. Uh, and then come along the fundamentalists who basically look at this and said, you're absolutely wrong. I think you've completely mistaken uh, uh, this information. Uh, I, we believe that Christ was a God. We believe he was nailed on the cross and he physically got up from the dead and uh, came back to basically wash us of our sins. And the Gnostics said, that's a load of nonsense. I could say other words, but uh, <laughs> it's absolute nonsense. You're mistaking a uh, spiritual truth with an actual event. You're m mistaking the fact that these are metaphors. They're not actual real things. No one got nailed to a cross. In fact, even the, uh, the Quran states that Jesus was never nailed to a cross. These people were completely mistaken. It was Simon of Cyrene that was nailed to a cross and took Jesus' place because Jesus had a mock execution performed on the private land by Joseph of Arimathea to appease the, um, mm -hmm. the Jews and the rabbis in the temple because they're going to be done out of a job. Doesn't it uh, hint to that in Revelations, though, where he talks about where my famous martyr was slain and, and it's Jesus talking in Revelation, supposedly? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they didn't sort of ex exercise every heretical text out of the Bible. There are things in there that shouldn't be in there from their point of view. Yeah. But uh, if you look at the Gnostic Gospels, which uh, have now been mostly published, oh, they make fabulous reading. There's one uh, which is the, uh, the Gospel of the Great Seth, which has Jesus talking the same person to Peter, uh, telling him that he was watching his own crucifixion, but it wasn't him. It was someone else called Simon getting nailed to a cross. And Jesus is saying, and I laughed at their ignorance. Well, no wonder that stuff got removed from the Bible. Uh, <laughs> even the Gospel of Thomas, the esoteric Gospel of yeah. Thomas and Philip, those are particularly damning about the fundamentalists. But you know what? They nearly won. Uh, it was basically because they were turned on by, um, I, I believe it was one of the people that was running Alexandria at the time, and also one of the Roman emperors. They so nearly won the Gnostics. Uh, it was just one of those unusual twists of fate in history that allow the fundamentalists to win, you see. And, and the mob now basically becomes the Catholic Church. Uh, but at the time they said, no, uh, these people are waterless canals. They profess to claim the mystery, but they have no understanding of the mystery. Uh, we always accepted Jesus as being a very important avatar, but he was a man, a mortal, not a god. Uh, the only reason that was created was because the Romans did not buy the story, because they had got used to idolizing their heroes as gods. So Jesus had to be made into a god and made extra and do extraordinary things in order to make him acceptable to the Roman public and beyond. And that's how the story essentially was sold. It was a huge lie. Uh, and even the Arabs said so, and they also had a great reverence for Jesus, and still do. Yeah. Uh, so all of these things have been completely turned around to have to keep people fighting amongst themselves. But you know, I go to Egypt and that part of the world, and you know, I have lovely conversations with uh, the Egyptians, and uh, we're all on the same level. Uh, and they also agree that it's a few troublemakers that are at the heart of all the problems. Uh, ba we're basically talking the same language from the same manual. It's just that the names keep changing. Well, that movie Agora really broke my heart when I watched it because they tried to, you know, recreate the fall of the Library of Alexandria and watching how their religions tore themselves apart while there were great teachers in this building trying to move things along and figure all these things out. It, it, I don't know how accurate the movie was, but it it was definitely an eye opener to see that maybe if that library still would have been standing, maybe we'd be in a different place right now. 
A little bit it goes back where I was saying as well. I mean, I, I lament the whole thing too, but I think it had to happen in order to show people what isn't, in order for them to understand what could be. Uh, sometimes you have to lose the very sense of spirituality to understand what you've lost in order to regain it. Uh, again, it's part of this big earth school experience that we have. And um, if you take yourself out of the picture and pull back from the earth uh, by a few thousand miles and see the big picture, uh, which is something else that the mystery teachings will tell you, is that there are cycles within cycles within cycles. You know, there's a personal cycle, and then there's your reincarnation cycle of why you've chosen to be here at this point in time. Uh, there's the group cycle, uh, which is you know, the kind of um, family and the groups of people that you uh, work with in your incarnation. But then there's also an earth cycle, which lasts, uh, you know, the half cycle is 21,000 years, sorry, uh, 12,100 years, and the full cycle is 4,200 years. Uh, and within that cycle, there is a certain thing that has to be learned by humanity in general. So again, everything is where it needs to be in order for us to grow as souls, because ultimately, that's why we're here. Uh, we're just physical vessels uh, housing a soul. And uh, when you die, well, your soul keeps going forever. And it goes on uh, to have another experience, because that's what it's all about. It's about the soul having an experience in a physical environment where it can uh, basically uh, make leaps and bounds in its understanding of uh, the bigger picture in the universe because anything that's in physical form is much more dense. Uh, uh, love is more intense. Uh, food is more intense. Uh, anything is far more intense than it is in the spiritual world. And that's why we sort of get drawn to this place and then we kind of find out that maybe it wasn't such a, a good idea because it hurts. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, ultimately when you leave, as long as you understand the lesson and what you've come here to experience, you've made huge progress. And I think one of the things that completely exemplifies that teaching, of course, is um, the journey of uh, Darth Vader in Star Wars. You know, the story is not about Luke Skywalker. It's about the redemption of Anakin, who starts off in the light, gets seduced by the dark, like any good Templar. And then at the end, uh, when he's finally beaten, he finally gets the big aha. So, you know, I got it completely wrong. I'm going back to the light. Bang. He completely understands what he did. And at that moment, he basically he's regenerated as a soul and he's cleansed of all his nastiness. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point of life right there. Uh, I think Lucas uh, was actually channeling. I don't think he ever probably gave himself as much credit as he deserved. Right. Good point. I think George Lucas was an occultist. But that's just my opinion we're going to take our break <laughs> and we'll be right back guys with freddie silva don't go anywhere we're going to get into symbolism and some crop circles and maybe is somebody out there helping us possibly we'll be right back Hey folks, CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why you ask? Because of what it does for the body. Unfortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. Do your due diligence and log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. At the Fringe FM, we value your opinion and we want to hear from you. Love a program? Got a future guest or show idea? Let us know. Email us at talkback at thefringe.fm or leave us your thought by calling 501-777-5631 or message our Facebook page at The Fringe FM. Who were the real ancient Egyptians? What is it about ancient Egypt that captivates us all? The critically acclaimed series Magical Egypt is back with all new episodes. Let Chance Gardner and company take you on another adventure through Magical Egypt in the new series Magical Egypt 2. Magical Egypt 2 attempts a forensic reconstruction of the science of the ancients through a study of ancient aesthetics. Also, the best researchers and authors in the field like John Anthony West, Graham Hancock, Laird Scranton, Robert Bouval, 
Lon Duquette, Aaron Sheik, and more join together to explore the topics of the esoteric and the hidden messages of the ancient Egyptians. Just go to MagicalEgypt.com right now and put in the code word FRINGE and get 10% off any download or order, including the groundbreaking original Magical Egypt series, as well as the new episodes in Magical Egypt 2. Also, check out the great work and the companion series at MagicalEgypt.com. Click the banner on the Fringe FM or go to MagicalEgypt.com and use the code word FRINGE and get 10% off your order today while it lasts. Hi, folks. Let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply and, of course, the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game, at the top of your game, with GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Again, GetTheTea.com. I'm getting older and noticing that my body just doesn't work as well as it used to. So I like to keep fit as possible by hitting the gym a few times a week. Recently, I started having a nagging bicep pain and it got so bad I couldn't even lift the weights. When I was complaining about it to a friend, he told me about Angioprim. He said chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in veins and arteries that may cause blockages. You know, after just one week of taking Angioprim, the pain was gone and now I'm back in the gym full strength. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in Angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. So to learn more, go to Angioprim.com. That's A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com. Or talk to a trained consultant. Call Angioprim toll-free at 877-882-7221. You'll feel better with more energy. Call 877-882-7221 or go to the website angioprim.com are you intrigued by paranormal talk radio you love the new paranormal radio app from talk stream live you'll find a great selection of talk shows covering ufos ghosts strange phenomena and much more download the paranormal radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment including the network you're listening to right now the paranormal radio app Free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Come own the night with us. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, host of Spaced Out Radio. Every Monday through Friday, right here on KTLK, the Fringe FM, I'm going to lead you down a path of mystery, intrigue, and suspense. So whether you've seen a UFO, had a run-in with Bigfoot or Dogman, or had ghosts running around your house, this is the place to be. Spaced Out Radio, right here on KTLK. This is Cortana from Shift Happens, telling you to pour a glass and park your ass, because you're listening to KTLK, the Fringe FM. Shift Heads. To Lighting the Void, fascinating conversation we're having with author, researcher, and speaker, Freddie Silva. Thank you for this conversation. This is a conversation that I've needed for quite some time. I go down many rabbit holes on this show, Freddie, and uh, this one, I would say this one, astral travel, um, all of that stuff is, all of that stuff is what I like to talk about because it's all related. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. You know, you become an intellectual and a scholar when you study things of this nature. But when you get into ufology, crop circles, even like Robert Schock told me that he finally, you know, said the Atlantis word on the show. 
You kind of worry. No. Yeah, he's like, I, no. I finally said the A word, Atlantis. But, you know, shock, he's got to be careful, right? Because he's, he's, you know, that's how he is. But he did admit it. You get to this point where, okay, some th- I'm putting on the tinfoil hat according to some people. Did you ever worry <laughs> about that? No, I didn't uh, because I know where I'm at. Uh, I, I know where my heart is and I know – and people who've – uh, who've, uh, I, I hate using the word follow, but people who followed me for since the beginning of my work, uh, they know where I'm coming from, and I have a very loyal following. And they, they know what to expect, and they know that I'm not going to preach to them. I'm going to give them a middle point. I'm going to give – in fact, I don't even tell people the truth. I tell people facts, which is why it takes me so long to write anything. Um, it's about – giving people the ammunition to figure it out for themselves. Uh, and that kind of, you know, take, uh, and in fact, I've had very little criticism aimed at me. Uh, I always kind of expect when the book comes out to, you know, be hit with all kinds of extremist uh, stuff. Uh, like, you know, when the Lost Art of Resurrection came out, I thought, oh God, all the Catholics are going to come after me. But you know what? None of them have, uh, because they probably realize that I'm actually talking the truth, you know, and I'm giving them the facts. I'm not uh, raising any uh, particular uh, points. I'm just saying these are the facts, and this is where they lead. Uh, prove me wrong if you can, but so far, uh, they kind of leave me out of it. So, no, I, I think I've, I've stayed pretty grounded in all this, and I've had good teachers to help me through the way, and I, I guess I didn't, didn't appreciate it at the time because I was, uh, you know, I guess I was a bit of a moron at the time. I'm, and the, now I'm less of a moron, uh, and now I can just go back and think, you know, these people actually kept me on the straight and narrow, and I didn't really fully appreciate it, and now I can't thank them because they're all dead. But I guess if I send out a thought, I guess they'll appreciate it anyway. So, no, I, I've always tried to keep things very much in the, in, in the middle of the scientific realm, but with an esoteric bent to it. Um, because, I mean, there's a lot of books, for example, which are you know are very nice, but they're very dry, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and you get bored. And for me, if I'm going to spend 300 pages and 20 dollars on a book, I want to be entertained as well. Uh, so what I do is actually I throw in a lot of science and a lot of fact, but I also entertain people as though I'm reading you a play or a, an interesting story. Uh, and that's where I weave in the esoteric part of it. And I think people, from the feedback that I get, they seem to like that balance where they're being entertained, they're learning a heck of a lot of stuff. Uh, and if you haven't been to one of my lectures, uh, you have never suffered a headache uh, because I will go for two hours, I'll give you 120 slides, and people are writing furiously with notes. <laughs> uh, and, and they, I mean, their fingers hurt. Pencils saying, are on okay, fire. My, yeah, yeah my, my brain is full, I need to leave now. I said, yeah, you know, but if you're going to pay twenty dollars to see me, I want you to get your money's worth. Right. You know, I've been to I've been to conferences. I was just at one a couple of weeks ago where, you know, I was sat listening to one person who's a, a New York Times best-selling author. Uh, I'm not going to mention names, uh, and uh, I thought, okay, I understand this. He's going to talk about a subject that's very interesting. I learned nothing in two hours. It was just filler, and I thought, well, what's the point? Uh, I would hate to be in that situation where someone comes into the room expecting something and they get very little. So I guess I'm very self-conscious when it comes to that. No, that's a good thing. You want to deliver, you know, people pay, you want to deliver. Exactly. But it does take its time. And uh, unlike Graham Hancock, who can afford research assistance, you know, I have have to do it all by myself still. I guess I should, I should should go on Kickstarter or crowdfunding. You should. Absolutely. See if I can borrow a couple of research assistants. (laughs) I bet you, I I really mean this. I bet you there are plenty of people that would be happy to help your campaign. If I wasn't bogged down with this network and two radio shows, I would jump on it. I I was, me and uh, John Anthony West, I was going to do the same thing for him before he had that unfortunate, you know, deal with cancer. I mean, right before yeah, that. Yeah, that's too bad. Lovely man. Really lovely man. Yeah, he had a lot of good stuff out. I mean, his book about a case for astrology and other books that I thought, you know, people were talking about Magical Egypt, and I still do. I thought it was a great series. But the the other books he wrote, the satire he wrote, the, the research he'd done, it was out there. But it wasn't being yeah. marketed right. You know, people didn't even know about no, some wasn't. of it. No, I know. I've only just come across uh, some of the more ob- um, obscure stuff. I, You know, you never get to hear about it. It's so unfortunate. And uh, it's sad because, again, he was a good entertainer. And he was also a wonderful comedian. I mean, his yeah. sense of humor was priceless, and uh, which is always the mark of an ascended being, I think. <laughs> 
but at the same time, he's also a scholar. So again, he also blended in all of these features so well and elegantly. And that's and that's what it comes down to. It's elegance. It's, it's how you do it elegantly. He could do it, man. He, yeah, I'll be, you know, I'm going to say something funny, but I'll never forget when he was on stage with Graham Hancock and it, they handed him these microphones and he goes, I don't know what to do every time they hand me these dildos or whatever. He said it in front of a crowd. And I was like, <laughs> everybody just laughed. And, I, you know, me saying it now, it's awkward just saying it. But I know he had a That's way to do it. funny. You know? <laughs> I mean, he, he had authority. He could say what he wanted. <laughs> but well, as long as you do it with a nod and a wink, I think you can get away with it. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like me. Right. It's like me on Gaia the other day. We were having a lovely conversation on the Regina Meredith uh, Open Mind Show, and we get along really well. I mean, we're like a brother and sister. Uh, people think we're having an affair because we get along so well. I was like, no, we just get along. That's how it works. Right. And uh, I said, you know, it's, it's sort of nice to come back on this show, and uh, you know, we get to learn so many things on Gaia. I said, yeah, I like the History Channel. We give you facts. I said, oh, perhaps I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get away with it. I think it's your accent that helps you, really. Because everybody's bragging about it in the chat rooms right now. They like your accent. Speaking yeah, of which. I'm not getting, I'm not getting rid of it. <laughs> no, don't. For real. And you're going to contact in the desert. And I'm sure the the subject of crop circles is going to come up. Now that. Oh, no. I'm sure it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> this thing has always fascinated me. I've I've gone back and listened to old shows that Art Bell used to get on. There was this big controversy. Some of them are created. Some of them are fake. And I'm thinking, okay, so I myself, I always like to go look at everything to judge it myself. Look, some of these crop circles, the perfection, the, the way they're made, I just don't think somebody, I could see where some of them are fake, but some of them, it just seems impossible. It, yes and no. It's a very, very complex subject, and it's been going on for over 30 years. Uh, in fact, um, there have been sporadic events that go back to the 16th century. So it's a, it's a phenomenon that it comes in and out of human history here and there, but definitely the late 70s has suddenly uh, appeared, um, exploded across the south of England, and also the Canadian prairies, which many people don't uh, seem to know. Uh, and in the beginning, there was nothing but real stuff, and uh, there were real scientists working on it. I mean, Pat Delgado was a former NASA engineer. Uh, so obviously, these people were very fascinated as to how weather and stationary whirlwinds could create these perfect circles uh, without destroying anything. Uh, and that's kind of how it went. Uh, and season by season, you'd follow this. Uh, and then, of course, the public got involved. It became a bit of a religion. There was all kinds of unusual events happening, like, you know, one day there'd be a 600-foot pictogram uh, not far from Avebury Stone Circle. And in the morning, all the people of the local village, uh, none of their car batteries worked. Uh, you know, it literally just drained the energy out of the batteries. Mm. Uh, it's a very expensive phenomenon I've discovered over the years. Uh, but you know what? Once that happened, then the government starts taking an interest. And, um, you know, if you look at the minutes of parliament, it shows that uh, Margaret Thatcher's ministers did bring up the subject of crop circles and the word surveillance uh, actually came up at parliamentary uh, speaker's time. And there's a small budget that was allocated to it. Now, what we didn't figure out for some years is that, that part of that budget was actually funded to train a couple of idiots called Doug and Dave to go out and tell the world uh, through the um, contacts that the uh, military and the uh, Secret Service in England has with the media, uh, in the BBC and basically make themselves the makers of all crop circles, which is a bit of a problem because at one point they were suggesting that they'd made three specific crop circles and they got their facts wrong because those three circles appeared in the same night in two different countries. Now, and I pointed out, kind of like John and Anthony West would have done actually, uh, you know, if they were able to do three crop circles in one night in two different countries, why don't we investigate Doug and Dave? Because I'd like to be able to bilocate I don't need to fly in a cramped airplane and suck that horrible air yeah, and get right. sick. I can be in another part of the world at the same time. Yeah, uh, and, the, cool. and back then, you know, the quality media like the Independent and the Times in England, they actually looked at the story and said, you know, we have, and I actually quote, I have an easier time believing in little green men than Doug and Dave being the makers of crop circles. And it was true. They got hit the nail on the head. I mean, what they made was absolutely horrible. But at least now we had something to compare it by. Now, you fast forward that story 10 years later, and we have actual professional groups of hoaxes going around, paid for by the Ministry of Defense, or, uh, uh, shall I say, a particular group of people within the Ministry of Defense who want to debunk the entire subject. 
And um, we even know where they live. I mean, the apartment in South London is even paid for by MI6. Um, and that began to confuse the subject. It began to bring, again, doubt into the whole subject, which is the whole point of bringing down anything. Always create doubt in the public mind. So now you have people uh, attacking each other. You have researchers attacking each other. Um, but it was good from the point of view that we were able to double-check our information because we were getting complacent, and that was good. We were able to go back and say, okay, let's apply a different protocol and let's be a bit more rigorous. Let's not accept everything as being genuine. That, I believe, was actually a great step forward. Um, and then it, by the time we get to the mid-'90s, we had this mix, depending on the year, of genuine crop circles and fakes. After 2003, and this is going to shock a lot of people on there, uh, as it will do at, at uh, um, Contact in the Desert, uh, after 2003, do not trust anything. Uh, you are chasing your own tail. There's mostly hoaxed stuff out there. Now, uh, people are going to say, well, you know, some of the stuff after 2003, it looks fantastic. I would totally agree from the air, from the photographs. They look really good. And you know why? Because these people are working with groups of up to 14 people, and they're paying off the farmers. They're doing them in fields uh, which are so far from uh, the visible points of view, because after 10 years, these people know the sight lines. They know where they can get away with murder on a clear day, sometimes as many as three clear days, and they can do some really complex stuff. But the trick is, when you actually have a trained eye and you go look at it closely, it's terrible. I mean, the breaks are there, the damage is there, uh, the compacting of the soil, um, there's no, the geometry is a little bit off, there's no energy that's detectable. But from the air, from an aerial photograph, it looks really convincing. And that's the problem, you see. So, And that's why I also I haven't talked much about crop circles in the last decade. I have really nothing new to add because the real... Uh, conversation, and it was a conversation, by the way, had a beginning and an end. The real conversation took place between the 70s and the late 90s, and that's where all the gold is. And that's what I always tell people. Don't worry about the time, okay? Don't worry about the fact that this year there were hoaxes and last year there weren't. That's not the point. That's a human uh, uh, sort of uh, trait that we have. We tend to get caught up in things which are yesterday. You know, we're into the cell phone culture that unless it happens within the next 15 seconds, it's not real anymore. So the point about the crop circles is that there's a real conversation full of wonderful information. And if you really want to get into the middle of what it's truly about, stick to that particular period in time and forget the last 15 years. Um, there's a lot of nonsense going on out there. Uh, and again, like I said before at the start of the program, there's a lot of information that have to do with technical information. There's uh, healing modalities. There's new mathematical theorems and so forth. There's something there for everybody. Uh, and if all else fails, um, go back and read Secrets in the Fields. Uh, I'm still told that's probably the best book ever written on the subject. That's, that's a subject. See, I don't want to... That's what I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to fall for something and then i'm going to get too deep into it and then it's just not going to be real but you know i i just think that it seems funny to me that every time we get attention about say for instance you're talking about crop circles and doug and dave well what about uh what happened to travis walton in project blue book every time we get someone's attention this massive campaign comes out to debunk it you know exactly i've met travis walton and i can tell you i've looked in that guy's eyes He's not faking it. Nope. I mean, you can tell fear. Uh, you can't fake fear. I mean, that guy's been through something. So, But you're absolutely right. Again, it's about creating doubt. As long as you create doubt, you have the public chasing their own tails, fighting each other, and the powers that be win, and they get forward. So the trick is, you know, uh, I mean, none of us are perfect. We're always going to, uh, you know, we're, we're going to mess up somewhere in life. And the point about messing up in life is that so you can get up again. So, uh, and I've learned this too. I mean, I've made mistakes when I was researching crop circles. Uh, there are things I had to go back and say, you know, I got that wrong. But that's cool. I mean, that's how you learn, and that's how you stay honest. Uh, and that's how you move forward. Uh, and I think people will appreciate that. Um, if we were all perfect, none of us would have bothered to incarnate. Let's just put it that way. So the trick is don't beat yourself up over it because uh, if you were so perfect, you would have been called God. You would have, you would need to have a, a physical body. True that. Yeah, I think um, I think we come down here in this physical body because maybe like I was having a conversation with Laird's Granton about, I kind of think that the spiritual realms – 
and the physical realms are codependent. Like we'd look at the spiritual realm as this amazing, more ascended place. But what if life is an amazing place too? What if they're codependent on each other? And he said, oh, based are. on his research, that that's pretty much the case. Oh, absolutely. I tend to agree with that 100%. I mean, they're saying that, uh, I mean, I've, I've been friends with some of the best channelers in the world. I mean, I'm talking about people who work with the police to solve crimes. Um, so that these people obviously are highly trustworthy. And some of the information I've got from one of the friends of mine that I work with in England is astonishing. Uh, some of it I can't really repeat because it's part of you know, my code of silence. Uh, and things come out when they're supposed to by the right people. But um, the, uh, part of the information that we were getting is that the spirit world is completely codependent on the physical world and vice versa because everything we do here, it all comes down to energy. Uh, we don't see it. We don't appreciate it. Uh, but you can feel it. Uh, you know, your gut feeling is uh, you know, a very crude example of feeling energy. Uh, we take so little heed of it every day, but you know everything that we do here has an energetic repercussion into space and time, and so the spirit world has to adapt. So, uh, you know, when you start looking into things like predictions and um, you know foretelling the future, well, that's fantastic if someone can do that, and a lot of people can do that. But that also is uh, surmountable to change because the the prediction is only as good as the event at that particular moment in time in the physical world what we do tomorrow to influence uh, the events on earth will have repercussions also in the invisible they have to adapt in turn but here's the uh, the paradox um you know the soul uh, uh, enjoys the idea of coming down into a physical body and incarnating and going for this extraordinary experience called physical life but at the same time, you're kind of lost. You spend your entire life reading books and going to conferences to find out what the hell did I come down here for? <laughs> There's the paradox. Yeah. Uh, and then at the end, you go, oh, I get it. And then you die and you go back. Uh, but that's the, the fun part of it. Uh, and then the spirit world is saying, well, now we really do admire anyone. In fact, we're envious of any soul that's actually had the courage to get trapped in the physical body because when you're in the spirit world, well, you can move about and be in different places at the same time and, you know, and uh, be, have different lifetimes at the same time and be in a planet called beach for a million years and not have to get bored. But you know what? We don't make as much uh, progress as you do when you're in the physical world because, you know, some things are not as powerful uh, as others. You know, tastes, uh, love, sex, all those wonderful right. things not as as strong as you are without a body. So they say, you know, we'd like to be asked for help. We admire people who say, look, I have, I'm, having, I'm finding a difficult time here. Uh, I need help from the, from the uh, spirit world. And they are more than happy to, in fact, they're overjoyed to be asked for help because it, it means that we're remembering them and where we come from. And they'll come down and they'll throw things in front of you. Uh, there'll be coincidences or uh, books will pop out of a shelf or certain things that you weren't expecting suddenly come in front of you. Those things are all devices that are created by the invisible world to help you remember what you're doing down here. You just have to be more aware of it every single day. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. It becomes like driving a car. It becomes second nature. Uh, it's about developing your, your inner tuition or your intuition. Uh, and that's what it's all about when it comes to learning about the mysteries teachings. Um, so it really is a two-way process. Uh, there is no separation uh, between the physical and the non-physical. Everything is cohabiting the same universe. It's just that they happen to be different stations along the same musical dial. That's all. You, do you think that, in your opinion, that these beings or entities or whatever they may be, have actually came onto this planet in physical form at one time. And the reason why I ask this is when you look at the ancient societies, like if you look at Laird Scranton's work, the Dogon or the ancient Egyptian societies or Gobekli Tepe or something, it's, this narrative always seems to see there's some type of origin point to where these people were being taught these things. Well, where were they being taught all these things from? The symbolism may differ here and there, but the fundamentals are the same. And, you know, yeah. they, they keep saying that it, it seems to, to look like that they were being taught this stuff. And I got to think, well, they either did it out of body or they were taught on this planet by something or someone. Yeah, in fact, yeah, I'm looking at that right now about all the, uh, all the flood myths uh, where everything suddenly seems to make sense. 
you know, or, or doesn't, depending on your point of view. I mean, suddenly, you know, 11,000 years ago, we all inherited agriculture, civilization, mathematics, astrology, astronomy. Uh, uh, we all had the same um, hallucination. Uh, it's quite possible. I mean, I've seen enough things in the world to convince me that we can have a mass hallucination. But also, if you read the myths properly, they all talk about the same things, that there were these gods here, uh, or half gods, half human people. Uh, they were very tall. Um, they had elongated heads in most cases, and they certainly knew how to navigate the oceans. They had complete the minimum of the understanding of the stars, and they could. Uh, they, they appear to be psychic. They appear to be in, uh, able to sort of project themselves to another place in the, in the world at the same time. And if, we were, if we're talking about people who are supposedly Neanderthals, how is it that they could come up with these incredible stories? It doesn't add up from the orthodox point of view. If they were stupid, they should not have been able to come up with such extraordinary detailed stories about these beings. That's not how you know, uh, stupid people work. Uh, either they were really sort of bad at uh, everything that they had, they were very crude and uncivilized, or they were much more developed than we're given credit for, or they were taught something by another civilization. And uh, I, I, I tend to put my hat in the last one, that there was another civilization here, probably several actually, that were living uh, concordant with humans, uh, with Neanderthals. Uh, but these people seem to have kept themselves to themselves. Uh, because the more I travel around the world, the more I look at myths and local folklore, the more I realize that uh, when we had this flood 11,000 years ago, suddenly you get all of these people arriving on boats from somewhere across the ocean to teach the, uh, the people who become barbarians how to become civilized. And the story is identical around the world. How is it that all these people had exactly the same story? So I began to theorize that perhaps these civilizations probably lived on islands, which are no longer around, like the one in the middle of the Atlantic or the one in the Pacific, possibly one in the Indian Ocean as well. And because, you know, the, 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 the map of the Earth before the flood, no one can really accurately, and any geologist worth his money will, will agree this, uh, that we can't really accurately present the, a map of the Earth before the flood, because for one thing, most of the Atlantic was actually in the Sahara, uh, and uh, you know, the water just emptied westwards in one big moment. So we really did not really understand how the Earth really, really looked back then. Continents went up, continents went down. Um, but the one thing was certain is that these people appear to be uh, desperate to get off these islands before they all sank, and they moved to the mainland, and that's where you get these hot spots of civilization. And in fact, if you look at the clusters of the most ancient temples around the world, they all cluster around coastlines, and they get younger and younger as they go further inland. So there's still not enough data to put this together as a theory, but it's a working hypothesis that I have that shows that there were these clusters of people who were way ahead of the pack, who certainly taught humans how to become civilized. And if we draw the, the parallel to, to today, for example, I mean, we, despite the fact that we think we're so civilized, there are still parts of the, uh, of the earth where people are still living a very rudimentary life. And yep. I probably would say probably happier than we are, by the way. Um, I mean, there was a case about 30 years ago when a group of anthropologists went on holiday to, to uh, I think it was Borneo, and uh, they were going through the jungle, and they accidentally bumped into a, a group of tribal people they had never even heard of before. And these people, you know, was just smoking their pipes and polishing their bows and arrows, and they went, who the hell is that? <laughs> these people were naked. The anthropologists were all clothed with watches and telephones and you know, and they tried to back out of there, but of course the villagers surrounded them because they thought, wow, these people, they're gods. Look at them. They're dressed like, well, they're dressed. And they had these unusual features strapped to their wrists. So they invited them for tea and gave them food and honored them. And, you know, the anthropologist said, well, we're too late. We've made contact. We've inadvertently altered the uh, direction of their culture, which is something you really shouldn't do, uh, mm -hmm. unless by accident, which of course this was. And uh, they, you know, they gracefully accepted the hospitality and then quietly left the next morning. But uh, they went back a year later, uh, surreptitiously, and they had found that just by that contact, they had altered dramatically the whole social structure of the tribe. Suddenly the head person wears a loincloth. He has a tea leaf or a, a, a big palm leaf wrapped around his wrist, uh, symbolizing a watch because that's what the gods were wearing, you see. Gotcha. So 
And, that, and so we're reliving this uh, moment in time that we also relived uh, 11,000 years ago. So just as we today have advanced people in the Western world and other parts of the world, we also have people living on a completely different level in you know, a smaller and smaller parts of the world. So why shouldn't it not happen back then as well? So I'm a big believer in that theory. Makes me wonder why. Even when you're saying that, I'm thinking everybody wants disclosure and they want ETs to land in their backyard or angels or whatever you want to call them. And too easy. <laughs> too yeah. And it wouldn't it really like is it is it dangerous still at this point? Because we do still idolize a lot of things, even as, as advanced as our technology is. You can get on social media and see the people and and ideas and things that we still idolize all the time. Absolutely. Uh, and we're still half barbarian, half civilized, no matter how many cell phones you care to have. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I do believe that uh, we get visited quite a lot. In fact, I was just talking to Clifford Mahuti, the uh, Zuni elder cool. at uh, the last conference. He, uh, he's a wonderful guy. I mean, I, I can just listen to the guy for hours. It's amazing how much these uh, indigenous people really understand and know. And for them, it's not a big deal. It's like, well, we don't kind of call them like you know, aliens or anything. They're just space brothers or star people is what they call them. Uh, you know, we don't take photographs of them. We feel that would be disrespectful. I mean, if they, are, if, they, if they say, well, would you mind taking a photograph? We would do it, but we don't do it out of respect. Uh, it's just like uh, something you just don't do, like, you know, uh, putting your cell phone on in a Paris restaurant. So you get kicked out of the restaurant. There are certain protocols you do with certain people. And um, but, you know, by the same token, the, the, the Star Nations people are always saying that, you know, we try to be as subtle as possible and we work with people who kind of get it, you know, uh, and we kind of tend to sort of feed information, you know, we drip feed the information usually to sort of help uh, groups of people, you know, understand a certain uh, concept or because they need a certain understanding that they need to apply in their lives. And then they we give them the tools and they, they use the tools by themselves. We don't give them all the answers. That would defeat the purpose of being here on Earth. Uh, uh, the Hopi actually are very funny about this. They said, uh, we're the ones we've been waiting for. <laughs> you know, they don't mind giving us a little bit of information, a little bit of help. Uh, kind of like the crop circle symbols, actually, because it's the same thing. They're giving us a little bit of help, but we have to work it out and apply it, and then we evolve by ourselves. Uh, if you're a Star Trek fan and you're listening to this, you'll know this. It's called the Prime Directive. Yeah. And uh, here's something that not many people know. Uh, Gene Roddenberry attended a seance with a very famous American medium uh, called Phyllis Schlemmer, and uh, she channeled a particular group consciousness. If you read the transcripts uh, of those um, readings and look at the next generation Star Trek and look at the scripts, it is packed with universal information about the prime directive, which is essentially is the law of non-intervention. The first rule of the universe, you cannot intercede directly in the development of another species. And that brings us back to the question of aliens. Why don't they, don't they intercede directly? Well, they really can't, and neither do they want to, because they can see sometimes where things are getting a little bit iffy, and they'll suggest a few things by talking to people like the Zuni or the Hopi or making crop circles. And a few people be, will be used to understand that and throw that into the public realm. And that's where basically the humanity goes, okay, 50% will say, I understand that, I totally get it, I'm going to lead a better life. And the other 50 will say, oh, that's horrible, that's devil worship, we're going to run away and get buy more guns, and if ladies land, we'll shoot them. But that's what human, being a human is all about. It's this experimental way station. Some people get it and some people don't. Uh, and that's why I think uh, the mystery of uh, you know, having aliens not landing is even much more powerful than them having landing. It, it's kind of like watching a, a, a long series of uh, a favorite sitcom and suddenly that romantic entanglement between two of the stars they marry each other, and that's it. It's over. Yep, it ruins it's the done. whole mystery because you know that's, you know, and the, the whole fun was watching this duality. Will they or won't they redeem this relationship? And that's part of that wonderful mystery, and uh, it keeps well, you guessing. And I, come on. You, did you watch The Sopranos? That ending really, uh, that was terrible. Best show I've ever seen in my life, and they ended it with nobody knowing nothing. And I was like, <laughs> seven, seven years. <laughs> Seven years, hey, forget, and that's how they ended about it. it. You know, in a restaurant, nobody knows what's going to happen, you know? Yeah, forget about it. Right, that's exactly the point. <laughs> I actually never yeah. saw it, actually. You never uh, seen I haven't watched television okay. for like 15 years, actually. 
that's that's totally understandable it just broke my heart but i do get your point there is a question in i was actually thinking of cheers no uh, sopranos uh, frazier i was thinking of frazier uh, when Niles is obviously lusting after uh, the oh, yeah. English girl. Yep. And that's what made it fun every single week. And then they get married. It's like, oh, no, it's ruined. The whole mystery is gone. Yeah. I remember that show. <laughs> that was a great show. It uh, was. <laughs> Joseph is asking in the Spreaker chat, does Freddie have any thoughts about Terrence McKenna's stoned ape theory or the influence of psychedelics on the spiritual tra- uh, traditions in general? Oh, God, uh, you should be asking Graham Hancock that. Um, I kind of do and I don't. Um, I understand where he comes from. I totally understand the uh, theory of using the hallucinogenic to reach another plateau in human consciousness. And, you know, shamanism has its place in society where, you know, if you get too bogged down in the physical world, you really need to alleviate that connection and that tether by going out that extra mile and connecting to a much finer level of reality. Uh, that's something that's been done since time immemorial. Um, and this is, actually goes back to our earlier conversation about initiation. Uh, initiation, by the way, means to become conscious. That's what it means. Um, and the, the whole difference between shamanism and initiation is that you could actually leave the body uh, deliberately and also retain full consciousness of where you were going. The narcotic or the poison that they used to take was literally to lower their heartbeat uh, to a point where they almost become dead. Uh, in uh, hallucinogenic uh, shamanism, you're using the uh, hallucinogenic to uh, stimulate vi- um, imagery, which is not the same thing. And any shaman that I've spoken to in Central and South America tends to agree with this theory that uh, you know they're, they're getting a little tired of these weekend shamans that come over from the Western world and they want to have an, uh, an ayahuasca experience. And they'll say, well, yeah, they'll get an experience. They'll see lots of brightly colored serpents and all kinds of weird stuff, but they're not going to be much the wiser for it. Uh, The trick is, uh, if you really want to do this properly, you really have to do this for months and months of preparation. You have to train just like a Jedi. You have to get yourself mentally prepared, control your emotions. Uh, And then after about six or nine months, uh, when you do these uh, shamanic um, hallucinogenic trips, then you actually take the hallucinogen and you are in control of it. It's not in control of you. And then the imagery becomes much more real. It becomes actually a point where you have a foot in the other world. Because the other, the other way around is that you're taking the hallucinogen to give you an, an idea of what it's like to be in the other world. And that's just basically uh, not the same thing. So I, I, I do agree with uh, the, the, the stuff that, um, that Graham Hancock has been proposing and Terence McKenna has been proposing. Um, do I do it? Uh, not really. Uh, I'm very conscious of my own self and my own soul. And uh, I, I have been on the other side. I have... I have visited the other world on a couple of occasions, and not because I was asking for it or I expected it. It happened quite by some um, bigger design, it's, you know, much greater than I am. And really? it really opened my eyes to the bigger picture of things. And um, I have to say, it was so enjoyable that if I was given the chance, I wouldn't come back. Uh, so that's where I kind of have to draw the line because I mean it's uh, I'm, I'm here to do a job obviously, and uh, I guess that uh, leaving early is probably not in the uh, the cards for the uh, uh, the people that are working with me in the uh, in in the bigger picture of things. But yeah, I mean I was taken out of body in a crop circle. Uh, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't asking for it. Uh, I levitated over one. Um, I spent about 40 minutes out of body uh, looking at these extraordinary people. And out of that came a book, uh, because up to that point, I had no intention of writing a book ever. Uh, I was just helping out some of the other researchers because I knew how difficult it was uh, to do what they were doing. Uh, And then suddenly it's like, uh, no, I seem to have given away my phone number and they're going to give me the the information. And they did. Most of that book, I feel, was just channeled. I don't know where it came from. Uh, and people really resonated with the information, which is good. Uh, and since then, I've had you know other similar experiences in uh, sacred sites. Uh, the Great Pyramid is probably one of my most memorable experiences where um, part of what I do with a small group of people is go around fixing the things that uh, silly people do at sacred sites uh, because these things are very uh, highly tuned uh, energetic environments. And if you go in there to do stupid things uh, and, and show frivolous intent, the site becomes polluted. So people like us quietly work behind the scenes to take out the garbage, so to speak. 
Um, right. So we went to Great Pyramid one day, and um, uh, we weren't able to get private access, so we had to be there with a hundred screaming people. And uh, we got to the top of the King's Chamber, and there's just four of us, and everybody left. And I thought, that's unusual. Um, let's take this opportunity to do the work that we came here to do, because this is very rare to get the pyramid to yourself in the daytime. Yep. Um, and then the, the lights went off. We are in complete darkness, so I thought, okay, I feel that someone's looking after us. Now's the time. Let's start doing some... Yeah. Yeah, now's the time. And um, so we got to work. We do, we, we do um, toning. Uh, we, use, we, we basically figure out the energy of the room and apply the correct sound. Uh, and I'll tell you, there were sounds coming from those three people and me that I've never heard or ever done since. Extraordinary stuff. Uh, and in total darkness, uh, and as these three people are my witness, I saw a, a group of what looked like 30 people quite tall, dressed in this beautiful white satin and very similar to the ones that I saw in the crop circle, by the way, um, come out of the stones and surround us and they kind of bow their head and I bowed my head and we're in, I'm in complete darkness and I can see them as clearly as I can see my bookshelf right now. Wow. Uh, and it was the most extraordinary experience and I thought, this is just the most wonderful thing. I hope they stick around because I've got so many questions and suddenly they're gone. And a little light comes back on again. I thought, what the hell was that? Oh, so we wow. took turns quickly laying in the sarcophagus for five minutes each because there was a very irritated Arab person at the very bottom of the Grand Gallery shouting something. Uh, I guess we'd overstayed our welcome or we shouldn't have been doing this. Uh, but, you know, we did it. And then we came out to uh, the blinding sunlight. And uh, it's quite clear that four people clearly wanted to say something, but we were too macho to say something. So I said, okay, I'll go first. Did anybody see what I saw up there? <laughs> and one of the guys said, yeah, these people came out of the stones and they were really tall. And another guy said, yeah, they're dressed in this beautiful sort of satin. You mean all four of us saw this? And we went, yes, but this is in complete darkness. Yes. Uh, I mean, that was an extraordinary moment. That's life changing. And again, it is amazing. And we weren't asking for this. We weren't looking for this. So it wasn't psychosemantic. And when I was writing this, um, uh, this story for the Divine Blueprint, my second book, um, I went to my library and I thought, uh, I wonder if anybody else has had this experience because it would be nice to have something, someone else validate this. And I had the book called In Secret Egypt by Paul Brunton, uh, an incredible writer who back in the 20s, uh, get this, he was disgruntled with modern life and the direction it was going. So again, nothing new. Even back in the 20s, the roaring 20s, people were disgruntled with life. He went walkabout. He was a very good uh, commercial writer, gave up everything to travel through the East and to Egypt and find out what's life really all about. Well, it turns out he had exactly the same experience in the King's Chamber. He actually spent the whole night in there, by the way. He described seeing the same people dressed in the same way coming out of the stones and taking him into other chambers in the Great Pyramid. And I thought, I could not have made that up. That is an extraordinary thing. And I uh, called up a friend of mine who does a lot of sonic work in um, sacred science, uh, a true engineer, uh, scientist. And, uh, you know, he obviously, it's like uh, Robert Schock, uh, like you were saying, you know, he, you can't mention the word Atlantis because he'd never get published ever again. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we're good friends and we talk quietly at the pub. Uh, otherwise known as the research facility in England. Uh, and we basically said, have you had any unusual experiences? And he said, oh, there are times when we hit a certain frequency in these chambers and these people suddenly come out of the stone and you can see them with your peripheral vision. But don't use my real name on this. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he'd also had experienced this. Again, the sounds and knowing the right frequency of each chamber, which you can do with a bit of training, um, you just have to feel your way. It triggers something in the memory of the site, and these people are still there. It's like you open up a doorway into a parallel universe, and they're they haven't gone away. They're still around. Uh, it's incredible stuff what you do at these places. That is an incredible story. I've, I've and you said the name of the book was uh, the secret e in secret Egypt, and in, in secret Egypt. He also did one called in secret Tibet and in secret India. Uh, I love Paul Brunton's work. I read everything he does. He was a prolific writer. And eventually, this skeptic, uh, he's an admitted skeptic, he basically um, taught himself to be a, an extraordinary spiritual person because of his experiences following gurus and looking at extraordinary things like, you know, uh, an ancient Egyptian, actually not an ancient Egyptian, but an older Egyptian gentleman in the 20s who, as a scientific experiment, uh, because he was bored with uh, Westerners coming over and asking for 
uh, proof uh, that uh, you can stop your heartbeat and uh, basically make yourself uh, look like you're dead for years and then come back to life. And I said, mm. He just yawned and said, all right, if you really need empirical proof that, that you can have control over the physical world, I'm going to have myself buried alive for eight months. You're going to have an armed guard around the clock for eight months, and exactly at six minutes past uh, six on this day, you open up the sarcophagus, dig me out, and uh, we'll prove. And I said, okay. And they did it. And uh, sure enough, eight months later, they dug him up. Uh, all he had was a tiny little reed uh, to give it some air inside this uh, this box. He gets up, a little sort of you know frail. He goes, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so even in the 20s, these people were still conducting these extraordinary experiments that show that the human, humans are capable of extraordinary things if, you can, if they can just overcome themselves and also understand the laws of nature. Yeah, Richard Allen Miller goes into that extensively, too. You know, he's kind of like, I think he's on the border of genius and crazy. He's so smart. But he talks about that stuff as well. You know, i got to ask you, and I've asked everybody this because I'm into this right now. And if you haven't, that's cool. But have you happened to read the uh, Emerald Tablets of Thoth? I think it's a ch it's channeled material, but it's incredibly profound. Have you read that? Someone else asked me that on my last interview, oddly enough. And I guess now I'm going to have to go back and reread it again. Um, well, it's just a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. Um in the beginning of the show, when you're talking about the out of body experience, how we work energetically and electrically, and that's the biggest things that they were teaching in, in these mystery schools. These were these things are in these tablets, and I don't know if they're real tablets that have been handed down and just came out or whatever. But I know that the one time I read them and listened to them out loud, I had a UFO experience, and so I'm kind of going through that with the subscribers and stuff. So I just I didn't know if you had, had touched it at all. I touched it in sections whenever I needed to sort of look at something and make a reference to ancient Egypt. I've never gone fully into it in detail, which sounds a little bit weird because I'm actually looking at a, a three-foot statue of Toph right now. He's one of my heroes. Um, his real name is actually Jehuti. Yeah, uh, Jehuti, right. Name. Uh, and, uh, and his wife is absolutely gorgeous, by the way, Seshat. Uh, she's absolutely delicious. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's, uh, the two of them are carved behind the throne of um, Amenhotep III at Luxor. If you ever get a chance to go there, uh, you know, oh, pay the guy yeah. some back. She should go around the back of the uh, this massive stone uh, throne that the statue's sitting on. The two of them are perfectly preserved. It's like they're the perfect looking couple, even though the guy obviously has the knife his head. Um, but uh, I suspect that the teachings have been fragmented over the years because the true Book of Toth. Uh, was actually lost. Um, it's something that I've always had in the back of my mind that if I ever won the lottery, uh, the one thing that I would do is uh, pay the uh, local Egyptians above, you know, twice the local um, wage to go and help dig out the uh, Temple of Toph. It's all buried in mud. Uh, the stuff is still there. Um, uh, and I suspect that uh, a lot of the books are still, uh, in stone are still, um, are still there. The other uh, mystery that um, some of the Greek writers were writing about is that the uh, true uh, tablets of Toph were actually um, sealed under the uh, the pyramids, um, and there's one of the reasons why they built the pyramids originally was to protect them from the uh, coming flood. Uh, and I'm a great believer of that. In fact, I even uh, might even think that the um, those huge sarcophagi in yeah. Saqqara at the Serapeum, uh, uh, because I mean th those things are beyond belief. I mean they talk about them being for bulls. Well, why would they? take out the bulls. I mean, the, well, the sarcophagi are empty. Why would you take out the bulls? They're not worth a penny. Uh, they don't even have jewels on them. Uh, these things were built for something other than putting in mummified bodies of bulls. And they're too big for the bulls anyway. Even the aurochs are not that big. Um, so it seems to me that these things were sealed so tight as to protect them from some deluge or for some catastrophe. And afterwards, the survivors, of which there were many, uh, they were called the followers of Horus in Egypt, I think that they went back fished out the uh, material and went back and uh, and used it and probably hit it again or lost it. Uh, we don't know. Um, so I, I do think that there's a lot of truth in the... Uh, I mean, from what I've read so far in the Tablets of Toast, uh, there's a lot of truth in it, absolutely. I do, too. Whether it's the real thing or not, I, I really don't know for and sure. I don't but, uh, I don't yeah, either. I mean, I'm just curious to have everybody's ring opinions to it. about it, you know. Yeah. But hey, truth we has got... a ring to it. Right, it does have a ring. That's a good way to put it. Uh, we got a few minutes left here. I want to make sure everybody knows how to find your work, your books, and that you're going to be at Contact in the, the Desert. If you can give everybody your website and how to find you on the web. 
Yeah, usually you can find me at the research facility called the pub. Uh, no, not really. Um, <laughs> you can find me at uh, invisibletemple.com. Uh, I'm going to be at Contact in the Desert, uh, which is uh, disappointing. I thought I was being invited to Contact in the Desert. I was looking forward to a weekend <laughs> of uh, apple pie and all kinds of other delicious things, but it's actually desert. Uh, imagine my disappointment. Right. So uh, I'll, I'll be doing a couple of presentations there. So uh, there's lots of interesting people. So do come along. There'll be lots of discussion. I'm sure there'll be after hours fun as well as always because you've got to have fun. Exactly. Thank you for coming on the show. It's been awesome talking to you. I really look oh, forward pleasure. to it. And it was everything I thought it would be. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. My invoice won't be too much then. <laughs> right on. I'll be sure to <laughs> send that check out. Freddie Silva, everybody, check it out, invisibletemple.com. Don't forget, tomorrow night we're going to have the Cruising with State, the Cruising with State crew on, and this show was produced by the Fringe FM and cannot be rebroadcast or syndicated without written permission. Music was by Space Station, Cassiopeia, and Chronox. I'll see you guys tomorrow night. <laughs>